Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us at your overseas home. My name is Christopher Nye, Senior Editor at your overseas home. And today I am chatting with um, Malcolm McDowell from Chase Buchanan about the financial considerations when moving to France. Now, uh, we're going to uh, have a presentation. And then uh, if you have a question or as we, as we go along, if you have a question, just, just type your query into the questions tab on the right hand side of, of the screen. Now, if you need a reminder, and, and you will, of anything discussed today, or you want to share this with your family and friends, uh, a replay will also be available on the Overseas Home website, uh, and I think we'll probably send it to you as well. So if you don't get your question answered, or there's something else you want to um, ask, then uh, do contact Malcolm directly, and all, uh, all his details will be on there, and, and, and you can get your, your question answered. Uh, so look we only have 30 minutes so uh we'll get on and uh, malcolm it'd be great if you could please start by giving us a quick summary as to who you are and how chase buchanan can help our viewers today indeed okay great to have you all here good afternoon everyone um absolute pleasure as usual um well i'll just move straight onto the slides because i do cover that a little bit there so onto page two so um i've been doing this for well it says they're 20 years it's actually 21 now <laughs> so, um, but I help expats um, with their financial planning. And I do that um, for people who are already expats. And I do it for those who are about to be expats. So, um, as you can imagine, there is a lot of planning to do, um, not just with visas and all this kind of stuff, but also with your financials and your, your, your properties. So, that's what I help people do. Um, look, at the end of the day, it's important that you're dealing with someone who's been through this themselves. So it's all very no, good, very uh, sort of knowing the theory. But my background is uh, I've been abroad myself for, for 18 years. Um, I came back to the UK um, just over three years ago. Um, never thought I would, but here I am <laughs> for, for family reasons and so on. But I still help and I still advise um, people who are about to go overseas or are already overseas. So um, I've lived in seven different countries now. So I've been there, done there, got the T-shirt, thrown it away again. And that includes France. So, you know, whatever you are asking about, whatever you're about to go through, whatever you're already going through, I've been there, I've done it. So please ask me any questions that, that, that you have about it. Um, it's, it's something I love doing. So on to, the next, on to the next slide, enough about me. Let's get to the interesting stuff. Okay, so... The, the sort of stuff that I do and help clients with is very much on the financial side. If there's anything that's more sort of um, sort of visa specific or, or that kind of stuff, I will point you in the right direction. There are specialists for that sort of thing. That's not my, my, my area of expertise, but anything that I don't know, I can definitely point in, in the direction of someone who does. So before I go on to the, this financial stuff, just want to make that absolutely clear because we do get, uh, having done these sort of presentations before, we do get quite a lot of questions about visas and, and this sort of thing, peripheral stuff. Um, but yeah, if you have that kind of issue, let me know and I'll put you in the right direction. Okay, so this first slide is to do with social security contributions in France. So I just want to cover some of the tax implications first with regard to France. Um, the first one is very, very simple. Think of this as like your French equivalent to national insurance. Okay, sitting at 9.7% at the moment. I'm not going to spend too much time on that, but just bear that in mind. The next one is the income tax for individuals. This changes every year in France on the 1st of January. So this is completely up to date. Um, and you can see those tax bandings there. So a little bit of um, background with regard to that. What you generally find in France is um, the tax bandings are slightly friendlier for um, lower income kind of people. So when I say that, I mean people earning less than 100 grand a year. Okay, so the high net worths and that kind of stuff, they tend to get a little bit punished in terms of income tax in, in France. If you're earning less than 100,000, it'll generally speaking, depending on your situation, generally speaking, you'll be paying a little bit less income tax in France. Okay, so that's, that's good news off because that's the vast majority of my clients sit in that kind of bracket. Some of them don't, I get that. 
but um, we, there are things that we can do for those types of clients as well in terms of mitigation and, and this sort of thing. So those are the up-to-date numbers as far as we can see. Um, yeah, as soon as you become a high net worth, it starts getting a little bit odious and fun, but like I said, there are things that we can do about that. Okay. Next, okay, um, again, the same sort of theme, uh, exceptional tax on high incomes. The French tend to go after high net worth. They do it in several different ways. Um, this is one of them. So as you can see there, um, the uh, uh, additional tax, uh, individual taxation goes on top as soon as you start getting annual incomes of over 250,000, okay? And you can see those, those there, okay? Now, this is the one that most people um, struggle with and there's a lot of nonsense spoken about it online. So let's cover this in a little bit of detail because it's important. Um, this is the real estate wealth tax. It used to be uh, a wealth tax and it is um, in the last few years it has changed to a real estate wealth tax. Okay. There's um, a couple of things to note here. Um, you only get taxed on your properties that you own in France and in the UK um, and anywhere else for that matter um, once you go over the 1.3 million euros threshold okay and when you do go over that 1.3 million threshold you are only taxed on the amount between 800,000 and 1.3 okay and you can see the the rate there is 0.5 percent Okay, so you can see the brackets there. You're not paying tax on the full 1.3. So you, need, you do need to go over 1.3 before you are actually taxed on the 800 to 1.3. If you've got a, a, a property that's at 1.2 million, you're not paying any tax. Okay, I want to make that absolutely clear. The other thing that a lot of people don't know is um, once you go abroad and once you're a tax resident in, 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 in France, um, you've got if you've got properties outside of France, yeah, let's say you're renting several properties in the UK or somewhere else for that matter, then you've got five years to do something about it. You do not get those properties do not come under this for the first five years. So be aware of that. Okay, so don't think, oh, I've got four properties in the UK, it doesn't make sense, which I'm renting out, for example, it doesn't make sense for me to go to France. Wrong. It does. You've got five years to do something about it, and there's other things that we can do as well. But just bear that in mind. So you've got five years on your properties outside of France. If you were to go to France and then buy a property that's more than 1.3 million, you will be subject to these bandits. Okay, straight away. All right, so let's bear that in mind. There's going to be different things for different people, but um, that's how the law currently stands. Okay. Um, taxation of income from movable properties. So this is something I always cover, although um, experience has taught me that not many clients um, have to pay this, um, but I do need to cover it because it's not something that's covered um, that you have to pay in the UK. It does not exist in the UK, this tax. Okay, so this is everything that's not bricks. So everything like jewelry, books, expensive art, uh, expensive vehicles and really remember they're only going to be taxing you on the growth of those uh, of those things so um, let's say for example you're renting out your Lamborghini or you have some expensive art in the house um, and that kind of thing um, and they're appreciating in value then you're only going to be ta paying tax on the growth not on the, the full value of the of those um, movable properties. Okay, again, lots of nonsense about this on the internet, but just be absolutely clear. And another thing is, this is actually quite a hard tax for the French to collect, because at the end of the day, clients um, and, and people need to um, tell the French about it. Um, and the vast majority of, of um, properties within one's house, most of the time, they are depreciating assets. Yeah, so. This is not something that most people pay, but I do need to tell you about it, just in case you've got some expensive art or this sort of thing and you want to bring it over to France. Just be aware of that. Okay. So that's the tax on movable properties that does not exist in the UK. 
and it's a 30% flat tax, just so you know. Okay. So, <clears throat> UK pensions while in France. This is a massive topic, okay, but I'll, you know, I'll, I'll cover a couple of simple things. So, if you've got a UK pension and you're in France, then um, what usually happens um, if you don't have your uh, ducks in a row, that your pension, you start drawing down on your pension in France, and then you will have to um, start paying tax in the UK and then make up the difference in France. Um, this is a very difficult thing to do and very painful. So I strongly suggest people don't do that. Okay, so it's uh, and another thing of what I've noticed since Brexit is that HMRC, who have been, uh, who, in my opinion, have been um, emboldened by this uh, by this Brexit thing, um, they have started slapping emergency tax codes on people's pensions straight away. So um, people think they're going to be getting X and then they get Y and then they have to go through all the process of making up the difference. It's painful. Don't do that. Speak to someone like myself. Okay, we can we can stop all that kind of thing. Um, another thing is um, it, it all depends on the type of pension that you've got. Nine times out of ten, however, it makes sense to get your pension out of the UK. Why should you be paying UK taxes on uh, your UK pension when you don't live there anymore? Why are you paying for you know the bins to be emptied, the, the roads to be cleaned? and repaired and all that kind of stuff. Um, it doesn't make a lot of sense. So what most people do, and I must caveat this, it does depend on, on individual circumstances and what type of pension you've got. Um, but the vast majority of people move their pension out of the UK. It's just a tax efficient right thing to do. It also makes sense in terms of succession, passing on to your, to your loved ones um, when you pass away um, and, and all these sorts of things. Um, basically, without going into too much detail, you have two types of pensions in the UK, really. Um, other than the state pension, you have um, uh, uh, defined contribution pensions, okay, and you have your final salary or defined benefit pensions. If either of those are not already in drawdown, then nine times out of ten, it makes sense to get them out of, of, of the UK. Okay, um, having said that, if you're already in drawdown with a final salary, okay, it does not make sense to do it. Okay, so it's all very bespoke, depending on, and also depends with defined contributions, it also depends on the amounts that's sitting in there as well. So these are all things we need to discuss, and like it says on the presentation, um, that's something that I do, and it has to be done on a case-by-case -case basis. Okay, if you have a defined contribution, for example, and you've already taken some of the money out, Okay, then you can transfer, believe it or not. Okay, a lot of people don't know that. So it's very bespoke, it's very case by case, uh, um, and, and things are changing in the pension world all the time. Um, but yeah, and especially because of Brexit, that's had an impact on things as well. But yeah, if you have a pension and you're moving over to France, talk to me, okay, and I'll tell you what you need to do. Okay, but it depends very much on your situation. Um, how old you are, how much time you've got left before you retire, and what type of pension you've got. So speak to me. Okay. Next, inheritance tax. Okay, this is notoriously complicated, but let me make it nice and simple. All right. So most double tax agreements between the UK and other countries don't actually cover inheritance tax. Okay. Um, However, this is one of the double tax agreements that does. So what that means is, long story short, is that once you're in France and once you've uh, become a tax resident there, you will be subject to inherited tax inheritance, inheritance tax, sorry, in France, not in the UK. Okay. Now, there's two sides to this. Um, obviously, if you were to look at this or, or first off, this tax-free allowance is obviously a lot less than what you have in the UK. However, there are very good ways in France of mitigating this tax, okay, which is something that I can help you. All right. Make, but you know, be absolutely clear in your mind. Once you become a tax resident in France, you will be subject to inheritance tax there and not in the UK. 
all of a sudden your domicile in the UK doesn't make any difference. Okay, and that is because of the double tax agreements between the two countries. Okay, just because there's a double tax agreement between the two countries doesn't necessarily mean all the taxes are covered. Okay, you need to read the detail, but I've done that for you, so don't worry. So um, the first thing you need to do is just speak to me and I'll explain to you with, with regard to these tax-free allowance. By the way, that tax-free allowance is for each individual beneficiary. Okay, so just be aware of that. And what we can do is mitigate those taxes. But a couple of things to bear in mind here. You cannot do this on your deathbed. Okay, you need to have this money sitting in one of these tax, uh, one of these um, tax mitigation vehicles in France from the moment you turn up in France. Yeah, because it needs to be set there in, for some time before you start getting mitigation benefits. Okay, so just just be fully aware of that. It's not something you can do last minute. Okay, but again, talk to me again on a case by case basis. Let me know what your situation is, and I'll explain the best way of, of dealing with that. Um, yeah, that's the. I don't want to talk solutions today, but um, in terms of your your um, inheritance tax, there are specific vehicles that the um, French tax authorities recognise um, and come to me, and I'll explain how all of that stuff works. Okay, not something to be scared of. Okay, I know that the tax free allowance is lower than what you have in the UK, but there's ways of mitigating that. Okay. Right, tax on traditional assets and portfolios inside or outside of France. So, um, if you've got portfolios which um, are sitting with a bank, sitting on a platform, sitting on a trading account, okay, the French don't care where they are, right? What they want to know is how much is it? Yeah, and whether you want to pay the 30% flat tax on that or do you want to pay income tax on it, okay? They will tax you on your worldwide assets, okay? If your money is sitting in a capital redemption bond and a life assurance policy, talk to me because that gets complicated. But again, they will want to come after that as well, okay? But the amounts will be different. It depends how much, how long... Uh, you've had that open and what the amount of what, what premiums were paid and so on. So talk to me with regard to that because that is complicated. But having said all of this, there are very simple ways to mitigate this as well. And often those vehicles are the very same ones that mitigate you for capital gains tax as well. Okay. And for inheritance tax. Okay. So just be, just be aware, come speak to me. Um, again, there's a lot of uh, stuff on the internet about this, uh, which you know, scares people away from moving to France. Absolute nonsense. Just make sure the only thing with France is you just need to make sure that you're organized before you come. And then once you have your uh, property and you have your address and you can show a proof of address, that's when you can do all these things. OK, so come to me and I'll explain how all of that works again on a case by case basis. All right. And that's pretty much it, really. That's very much a high level overview. Um, if you have any questions, fire away. If we don't get them all done today, don't worry. I'll answer them later on. Um, but there's a nice little quote that I put right on the end here. We, you know, we all have to pay tax, but there's, you know, there's absolutely no need to leave, leave it. Okay. okay. So, um, you know, back over to you, uh, Chris, and uh, let's let's do some questions. Fantastic. Okay. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much, Malcolm. Um, a really insightful um, inf uh, information there, and uh, hopefully some people have had any fears allayed that they won't be uh, be paying any any more tax in France, and it's all going to be fairly easy to sort out. Um, we've had a question in, uh, and it was going to be my first question as well, actually, which is um, if you and let me just find it here. Um, it's from uh, Michael. He says, how many days a year are you allowed in France before you become a tax resident? 183. Very clear cut. And uh, I, I guess my thought would be, um, OK, so I'm uh, so I moved to France. Uh, I mean, what's the process? Do do does the HMRC? I have to tell the HMRC I'm moving to France and, and then yeah. the French tax people will contact me. That's right. Yeah. So um, in an ideal world, um, you would tell the, the HMRC that you have moved to France. Um, that's not necessarily you're not going to get punished for not doing that. OK, so don't don't, don't think that you do because you don't, because I know a lot of people who haven't done that. Um, 
but you do need to announce uh, to the French tax authorities that you have arrived um, and that you are becoming a, a, a French taxpayer. Okay, and that's another thing I can I can help with as well. So, in, in as far as that's concerned, um, there are ways that if you're already receiving a pension, then there's something that we need to do together. Um, you need to go to the um, the French tax authorities, tell them that you're already receiving these pensions, and um, what we will then do is set it up in such a way that the, the the pensions come to you, and they're taxed in France. They're not taxed in in in, in the UK straight away as they would be normally if you didn't do anything we can make sure that they're taxed in france and that you don't have any issues with regard to that so that's paperwork that you need to um, request as soon as you arrive uh in france from the french tax authorities that can then gets stamped by the french it gets stamped by hmrc and then you present it to your pension provider okay and okay. then you just pay the french tax nice and simple okay uh now um I'm sure I'm sure your point about the movable items um, <clears throat> raised more questions than <laughs> raised a few questions. One is coming from Michelle. What's the threshold for expensive items? Oh, the threshold for expensive items. Um, no, it's not the threshold. For, it's the threshold. There is no threshold. Yeah, it's the gain that they're interested in. Okay. So technically speaking, if you had something that gained from ten pounds to fifteen pounds, you would owe them tax. Yeah. Um, again, it comes down to whether you would um, declare those things. Obviously, I encourage clients to do that. Um, however, it is about the gain on those. It's not about the actual value. So that what they'll be taxing is the gain, okay, or any income that comes from that. Okay? Is it a ta I mean, in terms of how many people, how many British people moving to moving to France uh, end up having to pay that tax? Is it like just one or two? It's, no, it's very small because the reality is that the vast majority of what's sitting inside your house is um, is depreciating assets, yes. um, yeah. including your cars which are sitting outside your house. So it's it's, it's rare, okay. okay? But I do need to make, make people aware of it sure. um, because it doesn't exist in the UK. So I just need to let people know, look, this, this happens, and especially for the high net worth. You know, I have I've yet to meet a high net worth who doesn't, uh, you know, or ultra high net worth who doesn't have fancy art plus all over the wall and has wasted a bit of money on this sort of thing. So, <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so that's that's just something I need to make people aware of. Yeah, because okay. there's going to be some people on this call who are in that bracket, and I can help them as well. Brilliant. Okay. Um, now we've um, uh, we had a question. Um, what, what you mentioned cars. Uh, we've had a question about how. Um, can I take my car to France? What, what are the tax implications of taking one's car? Okay, okay, yes, I get asked this every time, so <laughs> no problem. So yeah, I've been down this road myself. So um, if you've got any, any kind of vehicle, car, caravan, doesn't matter, truck, if it's more than six months old, no problem at all. There's no taxes to pay, you just bring it over you get it then um, make sure it's roadworthy in France and go through the normal processes. If, however, it is less than six months old, then you're going to be hammered for some taxes. Okay, so try and avoid bringing um, cars over, which are, um, which are brand new. Okay, because obviously, they're trying to protect their own market. So that's, that's basically how, how that works. The six month threshold, yeah, brand new cars, wait until they're six months, then bring them over okay okay um a question from rich which is uh, a great word uh, a great name for this this webinar if you move your pension to france are you able to move it back to the uk if you move back uh right okay no there's no need to do that okay because if you were to go back to the uk um the reality is is that they they the rules that they put in place about this back in 2006 um, you'll see them all on the HMRC website, by the way, and or if you type into um, uh, Google, you know, Pensions A Day, which was the 2006 when when all this happened, all this information comes up. Okay, you move back to the UK, you don't have to move it back, move your pension back to the UK. Your pension stays as let's call it an EU pension or an overseas pension, and you still have those benefits. And they put that in place because they realised when they looked at the statistics, believe it or not more than 80 percent of people who leave the uk actually go back ah that's interesting so yeah so 
um, and if you told me five years ago that I was going back to the UK, I'd have laughed at you. Okay, but different circle. It's usually family orientated. I'm really glad that I did go back. Um, it's made total sense for me. But you know, different strokes for different folks, right? Um, okay. So, yeah. Yes. That's that's the situation there. So on that subject, if I uh, if I keep a UK property and uh, I rent it out, say, and then I um, and, and then I get that that income, I, I'll just be paying the usual um, uh, the usual tax on that. Is that there's no sort of uh, punitive tax because of it being a second? No, 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 no. You you go if you once you move to if you've got a property in the UK and you're uh, getting income tax from that. Sorry, if you're getting an income, sorry, getting rental income from that, you then move to, to, to France. It's it's very simple. You'll be paying income tax on that on that in, on that income, in addition to whatever else you're. If you've got a job or if you've got a business or, or whatever it is, um, you will be paying income tax on that. So nice, and, nice and simple. Yeah. So uh, a question from Karen: If yeah. she is, when I sell my property in the UK, yeah, uh, at the moment she won't pay any capital gains tax. If um, if she moves to France and then sells that property, she uh, presumably would pay capital gains because it wouldn't be her own home. So she's saying, is there a best time to sell, then move without paying the tax? Yeah, I mean, selling the property before you move to the UK. Yeah, I mean, so before you move to France. Yes, absolutely. And I think that's how most people end up doing it. Not all. But but okay. most so that would make it would make sense to, to do that you know keep your capital gains tax as low as or, or, or on zero as much as you can so yeah that would make sense to sell it before you go to the UK um, another point as well hope um, just changing topic slightly is to do with your um, pension okay so if 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 you haven't drawn down on your pension yet before you move to France there's the twenty five percent tax free um lump sum that you usually get well you always get when you're in the uk and you draw down your pension the french don't recognize that okay there's a number of other countries that don't as well it's not just the french the portuguese the italians the germans and uh i think one or two others are, are, are going down that road now as well so um take your 25 percent tax-free lump sum out in the uk if you can if you're over the age of 55 and you can then i would advise in most cases that you do that before going to France, okay? But again, talk to me if it's a you know. Often it can be bespoke, so let me know. Okay, sure. Um, now we, we are running out of time, so if you were intending to contact Malcolm afterwards, you can uh, please do write down his um, his email address. Uh, we'll probably send it to you anyway, or, or you'll be able to access it. But um, but you might want to write it down just so you can um, contact him more easily. Okay. Uh, a question from Maria, uh, quite general. What is the tax implication of buying a holiday home in France? Uh, again, nothing that I haven't already mentioned. So it's it's not going to be a. a um, there's no tax implication for 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 doing that. Um, only if it you know breaches the 1.3 uh, million, then obviously you have that real estate tax to pay the 0.5 percent. Plus the other bits, if it's if it's way beyond that, so it depends on the value of the property is the answer to that. But yeah, other than that, there's no there's no tax to pay other than that if it goes over the 1.3 million threshold. Okay, um, so just just for clarity, if you intend to being in let in France for less than 183 days, you don't have to worry about. Tax Correct. Yeah, absolutely. So. And a lot of people do that so i get i have a, and i end up having conversations with with people who have holiday homes there and don't do the 183 days and they're concerned because they read all sorts of stuff about that on the internet nothing to worry about okay but as soon as you go over the 183 days it's a very hard thing to disprove because the stamps will be sitting in your passport yes okay okay so, so yeah it's very clear cut black and white just don't just make sure you don't do the 183 days um, between January and December. Remember, their financial year is different to ours. Okay, so just bear that in mind. Well, on that subject, actually, Helen has asked: uh, Is there an ideal time to move to France for tax or pension purposes? Uh, no, it's very bespoke. It's very down to the individual. So, no is the answer to that. It, it just depends very much on your 
circumstances. What you don't really want to be doing is, um, is you know, uh, ending up doing uh, more than 183 days in January to December, and then more than 183 days in the UK between April and April. Yeah, so that's something that you, you know, that that's when things can get a little bit complicated. But again, speak to me. Um, I can point you in the right direction of someone who can help you with that. Um, um, and, and make sure that you don't pay tax in both in both jurisdictions. But yeah, there can be circumstances where you end up doing that. But is there an ideal time? No. no. It depends entirely on the individual and their circumstances. Okay, fantastic. We've had uh, a lot of other questions. Uh, we're not going to unfortunately have time for them. But uh, like I say, uh, do contact Malcolm directly. And um, uh, and, uh, and including we've had questions from the States. And I know that Jason Buchanan uh, can uh, are, are licensed to uh, to give advice for American clients as well. Indeed. Um, okay, so um, thank you to all uh, our viewers for, for watching this, uh, this session, and we wish you the very best in your move overseas. Uh, we do have lots of other resources available to help you with your with your move, so uh, including guides, um, other webinar recordings. Uh, so do take a look at our website, and um, thanks again. And happy property hunting. And thank you again, Malcolm. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye.